We're here to talk about first novels. I don't know how many of you here are aspiring novelists. I'm sure some of you are. Um, it's um, an incredibly difficult thing to, to get published. They say that everyone has a novel in them, um, but it's not everybody that gets to publish uh, a novel. Um, I myself took nearly nine years before thinking about a novel to actually publishing it, and I rewrote it eight times. And it's been eight years since that, and the second novel still hasn't come out. So the, the idea of the first novel is always connected to the idea of the more terrifying second novel, which we'll get to in the course of this session. Um, but I would um, like, we're gonna talk about inspirations and challenges and the very important uh, question of rejection and criticism. But I'd like to first start uh, with a question to Lucy, um, whose wonderful novel, uh, Peculiar Ground, is this sprawling um, take through four centuries of English life. And it has to do with the idea of borders and walls, which is a very pertinent topic today, Lucy. Um, it also um, has to do with the idea of who gets to own the land. Um, and Lucy has written three biographies uh, before publishing this novel. Um, so I want to ask you first, Lucy, what made you want to write a novel in the first place? Well, I think, can, can, is this working? Can you hear me? No, use one of these. <coughs> uh, so why did I want to write a novel? Um, that question is uh, so easy to answer, it's almost hard to answer. I mean, who wouldn't want to write a novel? It's fun. Uh, I think the, the harder question is, why on earth didn't I get around to it earlier? This is actually my fourth book. I've been writing non-fiction the rest of my, my previous writing life. And quite why it suddenly seemed possible to me to write fiction, never having previously been, been possible, I can't quite answer. But I think that one pertinent fact is that both my parents died in the past few years. And this novel, like a lot of first novels, draws on memories of the writer's past. And perhaps uh, the fact that my parents are no longer alive somehow made it easier, liberated me, to examine my own past Without, um, without a sort of level of anxiety that I might have felt had they still been around. And also, it was a very consoling way of thinking about them. My mother isn't actually present in this book. For some reason, I couldn't really write about her. But there is a character who is quite closely based on my father. The character is called Hugo Lane. And he, as my father was, is the manager of a large private estate. And there are many narrators in this book. A lot of different people get to give you their point, different point of view. And we go inside the minds of those narrators. But Hugo Lane is one character who is only ever seen, as it were, from the outside. We're never in his mind. Perhaps because I felt it would be impertinent to try to imagine what it was like to actually be my father. Anyway, that's all a bit of a, a diversion from your question, but um, uh, my book came out in, in the UK in May. It's just come out in America. And so I've been going around the festivals and people always say, oh, what's it like to write your first novel? As though this was an entirely new thing. To me, it's my fourth book. And each of my books has been quite different, one from the other. Um, so the step into fiction doesn't feel like such a huge step. I mean, biography is another way of telling stories. And a lot of what I've learned from writing my previous books has fed into this new one. Great. Um, Priya, uh, Lena is also very much about the idea of a wall and a boundary. And um, yours is a very uh, tight, pacey book. Uh, it's not the, the sprawling novel. That, but but I, I, I saw a kind of resonance between both the works. And yet yours is not rooted in a specific geography or landscape in a way that Lucy's is very much to do with England. Um, 
but and I know it's been described as dystopic, which you don't necessarily agree with, but it's sort of set somewhere in the near future, which could be now. Um, tell us about the genesis of the story. Uh, where did it come from? Why did you want to write this book? And when you were writing it, did it, how much did it change from the initial idea? Oh, wow. Uh, that's an excellent question. I actually started writing it. It took me a long time to write this novel, and I started writing it uh, uh, I mean, possibly five years. So I spent probably five years on it. And when I started writing, it was, it wasn't, it was, a, uh, my novel is about this woman who's uh, separated from her daughter and she's looking for, her, she's searching for her daughter and as the city around her is falling apart and it's kind of uh, self-segregating, it's segregating and walls are coming up and she needs to, she's hunting for her daughter while, uh, while trying to make sense of the city and what's happening to her society. And I mean, I think I started writing, the, my point of origin was, I was trying to look at what happens when a society, uh, when a state decides, you know, when a state changes so much, then it has, um, governments have a lot of power over us. And I was trying to examine how that can affect one person's life, you know, one, one family, one woman and her, and her daughter. And, I think that's where I started with, and then all these dystopic elements, the, the elements that have been described as a dystopia, like, a dystopia, like you know, the walls and the, the sort of crumbling infrastructure, that all came much later. I, was, I started with the mother and her daughter, and, uh, and then everything else sort of followed. And it, it, it's, it's strange how it works like that, because you know, now my no novel has come to be seen as this dystopia, but you know, when I started, it wasn't a dystopia at all. It was, it was a story about a mother looking for her daughter. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think es essentially that's what I felt too, but I think that architecture is very interesting what we, what we use. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Diksha, the windfall is, was such a delightful read. It was really funny, but also quite serious. And I also learned many new things from your book, <laughs> including the great word staycation. Um, if none of you know what that is, then you should go and read Diksha's book. Um, it's about the family, uh, uh, a family called the Chas, who strike rich and move from their middle class neighborhood in Delhi, Mayur, Mayurpali, to, to the suburb of Gurgaon. And uh, it's to do with the particular moment in India of um, money and social climbing and etiquette. And I know that you began this, did you begin this when you were uh, in a creative writing? Did, yeah. yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit about the idea for the story and also um, the process of working on it with other people. Am I giving up on this? Is this working? It's working? Okay. Um, so I actually did start this as a collection of short stories. I was doing my MFA in creative writing at Columbia University. And so, you know, the, we're talking about first novels. I had written a book that I shouldn't have written, or that at least should have stayed hidden on my laptop, which I think everyone has one really bad book in them. Unfortunately, mine saw the light of day a couple of hundred copies. <laughs> so, um, but the advantage of, uh, for better or for worse, after that, being in New York, which is where I split my time between New York and Bombay, the advantage of entering the publishing scene there with a book that was quite well regarded is the fact that the American publishing industry sort of gets to steamroll over everything else and claim an international debut as a debut. So I got to have that privilege, and that was this collection of short stories that I started working on in my MFA. And one of the things I was coming into when writing this was that I was sick of reading and writing 20 or 30 something year old women. I just felt there were a lot of people doing it very well. I wasn't one of them and I was just sort of bored of that. So in one of my classes with our mutual friend, Gary Steingart, I started writing a story from the perspective of a middle-aged Indian man and really loved it. I sort of felt I found my true voice in this middle-aged Indian man. And Gary gave me the permission to keep writing through that voice despite its uh, sort of superficial distance from me. <coughs> and so I wrote this story about two neighboring very wealthy families in Delhi. I'm originally from Delhi. And I gave it to Gary to read and he came back very supportive of it and that uh, continued on to becoming my primary characters for this book. It was several stories at first. And then after I finished at Columbia and I signed with my agent with him over about two years, we converted it from a collection of short stories into a cohesive novel, which is what it is now. Um, 
we mentioned the word breakthrough and we all giggled over there while we were sitting um, in, waiting in the wings. Uh, was it a breakthrough moment when you discovered this middle-aged man voice? Did I'm you worried, think like, on uh -huh. so much pressure now? <laughs> 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 and my, I do have a, a shifting perspective, so I don't want the other voices now to be sort of left in the wings by the fact that I'm putting this middle-aged man up as my main character. Uh, so no, the freedom to write whatever I wanted to write, not necessarily write what I know, uh, that freedom, I suppose, was a breakthrough moment. Being given that permission, I don't know why I was waiting for that permission, but I was. And being given that by a writer I respect, I would say if there's anything that's going to come close to a breakthrough moment, it would be that. Great. So, Sandeep Roy, um, don't look now, don't, um, well, not don't, don't look now, that's the bad movie. Now. Don't let him know, <laughs> sorry. Um, is also about a family, uh, the Mitras, and it's also s it sort of moves between India and the US. And at, at its center is a secret, many secrets actually. And the, the, uh, the story works in a kind of unfolding uh, technique. And also like Diksha, I think you publish these as uh, short stories, standalone short stories, some of them. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, your genesis from making this cohesive thing, uh, the novel. Yeah, um, actually when Diksha was talking, it struck me that in a way there, there is a certain resonance in the journey. I, I, mine didn't come out of any MFA program or not. You know, I, I never <clears throat> went to any creative writing classes or anything. I am like many good Indian boys, a software engineer, went to America, worked in, got my, ma I have a master's, it's in a dynamic load balancing <laughs> probability theory in hypercubes and if, if my life depended upon it today, I would not be able to defend it, but somewhere it exists. Um, that was my first publication, in fact. Um, so, you know, so I just started writing because I enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. I was working in Silicon Valley and I was freelancing for small magazines and stuff, anybody who would, you know, accept it. And I started writing for pleasure and I thought I was writing short stories. Um, and some of these were published. One story was about a man and a woman you know, in a middle class Indian household. And the man's best friend comes to visit them from America. And it was about, and it was published in an anthology called uh, Desi Wala, by, edited by Sham Selvadurai. And it was about this best friend comes to visit. And it's a very strained tea party conversation that's happening. And as you go through the story, you realize that there was probably some kind of a sexual relationship that once existed between the two men. And, and you're never quite sure in the story whether the wife is aware of it or not. So I had that story, and then I had another story which was like a fantasy about a young man discovering his sexuality through a barber shop in Calcutta, which is not autobiographical, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to put that out there. People have asked me this many, many times. I was just going to, going to, to ask, ask you that. Um, the barber shop is real. The rest of it was the fantasy part. Okay. And uh, so I had that story. So I, I was working, thinking I was doing, working on a collection of short stories. And then somebody who knew me much better than I knew myself read some of those stories and says, who are you kidding? You're basically writing about the same people in those books, he's just given them different names and some are in first person. And for a few days, I was horrified, you know, because I thought like, oh my God, I thought I was creating this giant canvas with so many characters and really I'm writing about the same three bloody people at different points in their life. And once I got over that, I thought, oh, I could write these as linked stories, like have them. So unlike you, I actually had a conversation with my editor about whether we should turn it into a novel. And we decided not to, that it might be fun to leave them as entirely standalone short stories so that you can read them really in any order that you like. But if you read them in sequence, uh, the secrets that Tishani was talking about would slowly unfold like a mystery. So having, so reading them in sequence, you would understand perhaps a little more as to why the mother says some cutting remark that she does. And so it gives you a little added knowledge. So I, I thought that was a sort of an interesting thing to play with in terms of structure. I do want to ask you that horrible question about autobiography, though, because I think all novelists do have to find, uh, negotiate uh, that relationship. So what is yours? Well, um, 
as, I mean, novelists are magpies, you know, we steal. And the nearest, brightest, shiny object out there is our own family. And so it's, so there, I, nothing in that book is autobiographical. The closest autobiographical character is the son, who is the most boring character in the book, and it's modeled on me as the good Bengali boy. You know, he's like sort of the blandest one, but thinks his life is full of angst. And what I wanted to show in that book was this son, you know, he's gone to California, and he thinks it's like, oh my god, he's having his old identity crisis about his software job. But he doesn't realize his parents actually had far more tumultuous lives and love lives than he could ever imagine. Um, but what is autobiographical in the book are scenes. You know, when, when the mother wipes her hand on the sari, or when the son comes up to the mother and, as a little kid and leans against her and feels the cold of the metal from the keychain that she has mm -hmm. against his cheek, that is autobiographical sure. because I remember that. The mother is not autobiographical at all, um, as my mother <laughs> very quickly found. But my sister read it and she says, I recognize things of our mother sure. in there, in like, you know, little ticks, little things people say. So, yeah, so there are elements in there. There's a great grandmother in there that is entirely based on my own great grandmother. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and it's lovely to hear my great grandmother died when I was 15. So, you know, years later, to hear her voice in your head. That kind of ties into what you were saying, Lucy, about um, which, which I actually had not thought to ask you about the autobiographical, because it's it's a historical. It starts. I mean, it covers so much time. Your novel, but um, the those 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 real things that we steal from the real people in the real moments. Um, I wanted to ask you because you've written uh, biographies, which is in a way working with the material uh, we have of of real people and their lives and recreating it. Um, the act of creating a fictional universe out of nothing, um, was that a, a you, you said that it was your fourth book and all of them have been different, but were there other um, elements that you had to sort of work on or, or things that you needed to draw on in order to start with this very blank slate of the novel? Uh, well, yes, of course, when you're making it all up, uh, there is, it is a different process, but it's, it's not quite as different as I would have expected it to be. Because, of course, it, on occasions like this, very often the authors on the platform find themselves talking about the content of a book, the subject matter. But in fact, the work of a writer, as you know, we all know, is actually putting one word next to another one, constructing a sentence, revising that sentence, suddenly deciding that that sentence actually belongs at the end of paragraph 15, not in paragraph 3. It's all about structure. And that process doesn't really change very much, whether you're writing fiction or, or non-fiction. But of course, with the, the fictional content, with a story that I'm making up. I do have a different relationship to the story. I have much more power. I can, you know, I can summon people into a being. I can kill them. I was sometimes rather shocked by how many people I killed in the course of this novel. <laughs> people I liked very much. Uh, but of course, uh, what, one has this odd relationship with one's fictional characters. And they do sometimes feel quite separate and I observe them with interest, wondering what they're going to do next. But the truth is, they are all figments of my imagination, and actually, they're all me. I mean, there is one character in my novel who has the same kind of birth date as me, and the circumstances of her childhood are rather similar to mine. Um, but actually, she's less like me than almost any of the other characters in the novel. She's much nicer than me. And, but I very much enjoyed putting myself inside the head of men of different ages, of uh, w women of different ages. One of the advantages of writing fiction rather later in your life is that you've been lots of different ages. I can write with authority about what it's like to be eight years old, but also what it's like to be 60 years old. And uh, I rather like it that my older narrators tend to be more, more outrageous, more op outspoken, because you know, young people are so anxious about the impression they're making on others, whereas old, old people That's can say you know, what, what the hell they feel like saying. <laughs> so uh, 
all of that is fun. But um, you know, the, these people in the story, whether they're people who are sort of a little bit like people I've actually known in my own lifetime, or whether they're living in the 17th century, because the a large part of the novel is actually set 300 years ago, more than 300 years ago. Uh, they, they, they are me. They can't be anyone else. They can't have any thoughts that I haven't thought. They can't say any dialogue that I haven't put in their mouths. Absolutely. I think Flaubert said, you know, I am Madame Bovary, and I think this idea that you are all your characters and that they come from you. And, and, and the process when you're in the novel, it's a very um, intense thing to be right in the, in the tunnel of the novel. Prayag, maybe you can jump in here. I also wanted to talk because you and Sandeep both have experiences as being a journalist, uh, journalist before writing. And, you know, there's a whole lot of talk about the idea of truth. And fiction writers, of course, always maintain maintain that their truth is a higher truth. Um, so as a journalist, I am, um, and, and as someone who has moved between these two forms, maybe talk a little bit about, um, about that experience of finding this other voice and how that has been for you. Well, I think with journalism, uh, which I really enjoy, and I, I'm still, I still work as a journalist, um, uh, I think one thing I encountered was you come to see the limitations of you know what you can achieve in in an article, and you come to see no matter how closely you try and <clears throat> approach uh, whatever truth you're trying to write about, um, you know you come to see that you can only approach it un to a certain degree, to a certain extent. And uh, with fiction, it allowed me to you know of course it's fiction is uh, you're you know you're creating a fantasy world and you're you know you're creating these characters, but you know, I was able to really show some things that I had, you know, grown up with. Some, some, some long. Uh, I mean, and this it actually goes back to your point about autobiography and how much of ourselves we put into a novel. I remember uh, years ago, I was here. I was here at Jaipur uh, many years ago, um, and Martin Amos was here, and I, I, I went to his session, and he was talking, and he said, and I might be misquoting him here, but uh, he said something like. Uh, you know, your first, no your first book is about yourself, and your second book is about your city, and the third, your third book is about the world. And, you know, this really made a deep impression on me because I had this idea about writing, you know, I, I wanted to write this story about this kind of middle-aged woman who's losing her daughter, and, you know, it's, it's nothing that I knew, you know, I didn't know anything. So I, when I heard him say this, I kind of panicked. Because I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm not writing like this at all. Like, I'm writing something completely different. But uh, what I found when I, you know, by the time I finished the book, what I found was I put so much of myself into this character, into Shalini, into my narrator, into the protagonist. Um, you know, there was so, the, I think that the, the scenes that people talk, write to me about and people talk to me about from my novel tend to be the ones that I, you know, I, I have gone through myself. And you know, though I, I put them in, uh, into the voice of this middle-aged woman, uh, you know, this sort of 50-year-old or 45-year-old woman, um, it was actually, you know, those are the scenes that I actually went through. You know, that, those are the things that I've experienced myself and, you know, my guilt and the various guilt you have about growing up with a certain amount of privilege in India. You know, all of that went into the novel and those are the things that people have really stated, that people really... Have responded you know, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I want to, um, well, Sandeep, do you want to jump in about the journalism thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, yeah, I worked as a journalist for many years before writing the novel and, uh, I mean, the, oddly, I used to actually, I mean, in terms of the writing part, when I used to steal time from my software engineering days and write, that was in a way easier because it was almost a different part of my brain being used. Now, as a journalist, the tussle is to set aside time to do what is creative writing, which does not have the deadline of day after tomorrow or four hours from now. So, so that journalism writing puts a lot of pressure on me. What really affected my writing a novel was the fact that not, not just that I was a journalist, but that I actually worked in radio. And working in radio as a radio journalist taught me enormously about being like really careful about the words you chose, because you had so little time. And you were talking, you were describing something to an audience who could not see it. 
So you had to convey a scene or whatever in very as succinctly as you could, as you could possibly could. And so that, and, and I got into the habit on radio of reading my pieces out aloud while I was writing it. And even when I was writing a novel, I would read it aloud. And that really helped actually in the end with dialogue and things like that. Diksha, I want to bring you in. And I think this is a question that probably everybody in the audience would like to know, and that certainly everyone who writes and uh, is in the, in, in the practice of writing has had to, at some point, deal with uh, rejection and with criticism. I mean, I think this, uh, we were talking about this earlier, Prayag, about the, the, the great freedom that writing your first book allows you, because actually nobody knows who you are, and you can do whatever you want, and nobody's going to compare it to anything that you've written before. But then once you do uh, get to that thing of publishing a book, then it stands by itself, and then you have to deal with all the stuff that that brings. One of which is also, I think someone I was talking to yesterday mentioned something called the imposter syndrome, that you feel like, oh, what am I doing here? Am I allowed to be here? So I'd like all of you to respond to that, but Diksha, if you could start. I've been having that in the author's lounge here. <laughs> so it's constant. But you know, I timed it really well for this because four weeks before my book hit shelves, I had a baby. So <laughs> I was really forced to, um, I was really forced to limit my attention to Googling myself, to seeing exactly what every review was saying, exactly what every critic was saying. And that was not by accident. I actually did think through. It's a high anxiety period. So if you throw yourself into something that's even worse anxiety, then you know you sort of <laughs> have a oh, way. Planning. It was very far planning. So you, I had a nice plan. you actually <laughs> planned to have the baby around the time your book was coming. Yeah. Out. I will say that it it crossed my mind. <laughs> I, I, I guess women are luckier in something. That <laughs> I'll say it crossed my. But now if my husband had published a book a month later, he would have the same luxury. Uh, but no, I I it, I had. And I still have very little time, fortunately, to obsess over what everyone says, because it's so easy. It's not just critics anymore, right? You put on Twitter, and for some reason, people find it necessary to tag you while they criticize you. And I just don't understand that. It's like, and, and, and of course, then I'll go and check, and I'll allow myself to get annoyed. And it's horrible. It's, but then that helps that I've just been so exhausted and so tired that I don't have the mental space for it, because I think it can be so toxic, and it can really get in the way of your future future work. Um, my next book is due, I know you're probably going to come to this, but it's due in a few months. And it's really hard when it's so fast on the heels of the previous one to be able to sort of set that aside and let that be on its own in the world where I have no control over it anymore. And I, I, I don't want to do that dull thing of comparing it to parenting, but it is so similar because I'm so aware of this child that at some point will be out in the world where I have no control. And the book is similar in a way. It's a similar baby. But just. Uh Tell us a little bit more about this transformation that happens from being a student of creative writing, being someone who's always aspired to write, and then actually having your book published. There is a moment of transformation. Absolutely. There is the thing of, oh, I am a writer. Talk, talk to us a yeah. little bit about how that was for you. It was, uh, it was disorienting. The imposter syndrome is very true, and I don't know if that ever goes away. I'd be curious to ask well, not any of these panelists, but panelists on uh, people who publish several books. I wonder if that does ever leave you, and I wonder if it's a bad thing if it leaves you. Does your writing suffer if you suddenly become confident as a writer? I hope not. Um, I, I have had the good fortune of my book being very well received, so I, I myself am curious to see how that affects my writing going forward, whether or not or whether or not I'm even able to judge. I guess the next round of reviews, the next round of criticism will make me aware of how this transformation that you mentioned has affected my own writing. I think right now I have blinders on. I've been sort of so immersed in launching this book and immediately moving on to something else that I don't yet have the enough distance to see how it's affected me as a writer or a person. Lucy, maybe we should defer to your wisdom on book four. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, does it ever get easier? Um, does the, does the, the skin actually develop a kind of thickness that can withstand uh, the kind of certain degradations that, that writers have to suffer? Well, I think it does have to get, it has to get thick. Or, or I think maybe it always is, because to write a book is a very arrogant thing to do. I mean, we, we all assume we have something worth saying, and that you lot need to listen, because um, we're, we're very pleased with ourselves. And so I think that that, that helps. 
that kind of confidence in, in your writing, you may be a very shy person, you may be very anxious about your appearance or whatever else, but um, if you're a writer, you probably um, have some respect for your own writing. Uh, so, and it's very important to hang on to that. Uh, I know other writers who, when they've finished a book or getting close to finishing it, or maybe all the way along the way, will show it to their friends or in the evening, they might even read aloud to their partner what they've written that day. I find that incomprehensible. I don't want anyone else's opinion until I'm absolutely certain that I've done the best I can do. And then I show it to my agent, my publisher, my friends and relations. And, and sometimes I listen to their advice, but, but not always. And w my last book, the biography of D'Annunzio, The Pike, is about this um, d disgraceful but rather fascinating character who had a very busy life, which involved uh, a public life as a, a nationalist hero, a military figure, um, and in the end, the dictator of a tiny little city-state. But he also had a very busy private life as a serial seducer and someone who enjoyed himself in all sorts of ways in private. And when I first had this, what I thought was um, a pretty well-finished text, I showed it to my agent, who is female, and I think this is relevant. Uh, she said, it's wonderful, but it's too long. You need to cut. Um, I love all the part about the, the love affairs and the decoration and the parties and the fun, uh, but couldn't you just cut down on the bit about the war? And then it, my editor also read it, and he's a man, and he said, it's wonderful, but you have to cut. I love every bit about the war. Couldn't you cut out all the love affairs? <laughs> and because they completely contradicted each other, that gave me permission to totally ignore what they both said. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> of reading uh, War and Peace and saying, oh, I really love the ballroom scenes, but the war <laughs> scenes go on for a bit too long. Yeah, so it's good to keep it both, yeah. Prayag, do you have something to add about what we were talking about earlier, this whole thing of the transformation of finally being this want to be writer or an aspiring writer to actually being published and what it means to be a writer? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I think when you're, when you're writing, you sort of like, you know, you lock yourself up in, your, in a room and you, you, you emerge five years later or four years later almost. And um, I th it's a constant struggle because, you know, you constantly have to convince yourself that what you're saying is, has some value, it has some worth. And you know you read, uh, you know you, you 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 turn to the internet and you start reading long interviews. You know the Paris Review does this brilliant uh, these author interviews, and I would I would keep reading them and reading what various or how with the process you know of various writers what they did. And I remember I was struck by what you said earlier because uh, this guy uh, Nabokov, you know, he used to read to his wife every day. He would like at the end of his day's writing, he would sort of sit down and you know he would read to his wife and he would like. And of course, he was expecting to be told he's a genius every day. And he's like, and I, I was trying to think if I would ever do that, if I could ever like, you know, sit down and actually like ask my wife, demand this of my wife every day and, and to have that confidence in your own work. It's, it's not easy, you know, you're constantly sort of questioning yourself. You're constantly thinking about, uh, you know, whether, whether your work has any value, whether your point has any value, you know, it is a certain. So when you come to, I mean, when you come to, and then when you finally, publish it you know when you're finally published and your, your your work is out there and people have liked it you know it's it's still kind of a shock it still comes to you as a shock because you're still kind of surprised that people actually had you know want to read your work have you had any surprising uh, relation like uh, sort of responses from readers what has been the most surprising response from a reader <laughs> I'm constantly surprised that people like the book. Uh, that people read it. <laughs> yeah, that people are reading it. Uh, it's lovely. It's actually been so, and it's it's great to come to something like this because you you know you encounter you meet young readers, you meet a lot of people. Um, I think you know my book. Uh, one response that I really enjoyed. My book kind of ends on a kind of uh, cliff. You know, it's not it's not it's not exactly clear what happens at the end and. Um, I, 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 I spoke at a university, uh, Jindal University, a, a few months ago, and you know they, they had studied in class. They'd, they'd been reading my book for their class, and so they'd all read. The, you know, this entire class had read my book with a, You know, they were very engaged readers. They read it with a lot of attention, and 
um, you know, this, uh, this uh, young student came up to me, this girl came up to me and she was like, she asked me during, the, during my talk after the, when the question and answer was, she was like, you know, so what happens at the end? Is it, you know, is it, uh, is that her daughter? Is that not her daughter? Whatever. And I, so I, I told her, I was like, no, that's the point of the book. It's not, uh, you know, it's not, uh, I don't want to let on, you know, I don't want to tell you what it is. You have to draw your own meaning from it. And she's like, okay, that's okay. You know, she accepted the answer. She didn't seem very happy, but she accepted the answer. And then after the session was over and we were sort of, I was walking down the, this hallway, she came up to me again. She's like, can you tell me now? <laughs> <laughs> she's like, can now, now, and I was like, no, yeah. actually. Yeah. Sandeep, I mean, I'm very struck by this actually because I'm uh, married to a writer and we do talk about work, but I think when you are a writer and maybe uh, your support structure, whether it's your family or partner or whatever, is not a writer, it's very difficult to actually describe what it is that you do. I know I lived for many years at home with my parents when I moved back because I had no money. And my mom would be like, you know, I need to go buy some curtains. And I said, I'm working. But mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to get everybody else to understand how serious it is for you to be doing nothing but just being at your desk and trying to do something. So Sandeep, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, that for you and how um, it was for you to create this space for yourself as a writer. It was difficult. and. I'll answer it in brief. Like, I, I lived in the in San Francisco for many years, so there's there's the issue of creating the space in San Francisco, and then issue of creating space in India, and they are very different. Though in, in San Francisco, it was much easier. In a in a sense, I lived by myself with my partner, and uh, you know it was our space. Though he would complain, you know, all I see is the back of your head. You come back, and then you turn, you're at the computer, and it's the back of your head syndrome. And I th I think it was all the evil eye he cast on the back of my head that caused my hair loss eventually <laughs> to happen. Um, but when I came back to India, it was different because you're right, it's, it's not just, I mean, it's not just your mother wanting to go buy curtains. The doorbell rings all bloody day. You know, because every, even like the electricity bill, the phone bill, everything is delivered courier. by a courier. Everyone requires your signature. I'm like, you know, why can nothing be just dropped through the <laughs> mail slot? So it's all day long people are coming and, and sort of interrupting your space. So you really have to learn how to carve it. And, and it's, in a way, if you live by yourself, if I was at my flat on my own, it's worse because then I do have to answer the door every, every time. If, I, if there are other people in the house, maybe they can occasionally uh, do it. So it is difficult because, yeah, at, at some level, people do think you do nothing because you're just, you know, that is the essential. You don't, I mean, um, and at some level, people just thought I was not grown up. You know, like, like you didn't go to the office, you know, everybody else went to office. So your neighbors would say, so you're done with studying? I'm like, yeah, done with studying. So you're, you're not doing a job now? And, like, and people say, he was a very good student. <laughs> it's like a grand failing that now I'm like some kind of a drug addict or somebody just sitting at home all day. Though when the book comes out, but I mean that I'm used to as a, as a sort of, I mean, when you're talking about imposters, I mean the whole writing thing felt like an imposter to me as someone whose background was in software engineering. So I was always so closeted about the writing part. I, I you know, I developed, uh, I'm, I'm okay with being an imposter. Now, growing a thick skin, that's a very different matter. And if I look at many famous writers on Twitter right now, I, I think that maybe you just don't grow it at all. <laughs> it just depends on, you know, they get in, they take great umbrage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Diksha, you want to jump in? I mean, you also are now a, a new mother. You have a second book coming up. This, this question of space, this question of uh, continuing along this, this path that you started, it must be really intense moment. It's exhausting and it's difficult, but you know, it's, if I want excuses to not write, I always have them. I've had them from before I became a mother, from before I got married. And if I don't want excuses, I don't have them. So it's really, I, I, for me, I feel it's really up to me how and when I work and whether or not I work. And there's days, even you know, for, for the past several years, nothing to do with parenthood. There's days when nothing comes and there's days when it just works. And there's nights when it works. I have no schedule, I have no routine. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Right now, I have so many excuses to not work that I'm all the more determined to work. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we need to talk about the idea of persistence. And I want to come back to the idea of rejection, because I think nobody has shared their rejection <laughs> stories, uh, which, you I, know, is I a can. big part of, of, of um, uh, trying to get a book published. And, and even once you get a book published, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the doors are all open. So uh, could you say something about this, this uh, what your relationship with that has been or your yeah, experience? Um, well, I have the good fortune of before I started writing, I was an aspiring actress. And if you ever want to be forced to develop thick skin, I would suggest going into acting, especially in India, where you enter a room, people look you up and down and tell you you're not good looking enough. <laughs> Once you suffer through that enough times, no one can say anything about my writing that can hurt more than the cutting remarks about my physical appearance. <laughs> so that actually genuinely helped. And like everyone, when I went into it, I, I um, sent my manuscript out to quite a few agents where I wasn't getting responses or sort of silence. Or, and that's also when you start to realize that it's such a big industry, the publishing industry, it's so vast. I mean, on the one hand, once you're in it, it's so tiny, but before you're in it, it's so huge. And there's no, it seems impossible to get a footing, and I was just not getting responses. And I was starting to lose faith in it, but then one of my professors put me directly into contact with an agent. It just had to happen through that personal contact. I wish I had a better story of one person saw my genius, but it was a direct <laughs> connection to, an age, to a couple of agents. Um, yeah. And at that point, once I had these direct introductions from a very established editor, at that point, I got multiple agent offers. And from then, my agent who I ended up signing with has shielded me from so the rejection. So you've had a very good experience. I did. Lu Lucy, I'd like for you to talk about persistence and stamina um, as a writer, because I feel that these are two uh, particularly with the no with the novel, the long form, uh, there is a sense of this. This I always feel like it's a kind of tunnel you enter when you decide to write a, a book. And could you tell us a little bit about uh, how important it is to have that persistence? Well, of course, it takes a long time to write a book. Oh, it takes me a very long time. I know there are some authors who are very very quick, but I'm not one of them. But also, I'm not sure that writers should be too persistent. And that being a writer, it's not the same as being an, an electrician, that you know, in the morning you go and fix somebody's wiring and then you finish that job and in the afternoon you go and fix wiring in another house, going from one job to another doing the same thing. I've written only four books, which doesn't seem very many. I mean, you know, so there are people who've written literally dozens of books by the time they're my age. And I've, meanwhile, I've been doing a lot of journalism. I've always been writing, but um, I don't really want to embark on a book until I've got something that I really want to say. And so I think that just you know, keeping at it isn't necessarily the right way to go about it. And, and most of the writers I know do other work. They teach, they do journalism, or they do something completely different, working in software, perhaps. And I think that's a good thing you know, to engage with uh, the normal world of work. Because, of course, what we do is, is pretty weird. It's solitary, it's, um, and it doesn't uh, put you in touch with the life around you. So that, by all means, you know, have the courage to keep going. But, you know, you don't have to be on a book the whole time. Um, I'm now going to trump your story. I gave birth to two babies the week my first <laughs> book was written. <laughs> pair of twins. Uh, whereupon I, uh, I didn't write another book for 10 years. And I don't regret that. I mean, I kept doing, reviewing bits of journalism. You know, it wasn't that I wasn't writing at all. But I, I mean, I salute you. But I didn't find it possible to get the kind of deep concentration you need to write a, a long piece of work until my, my girls were safely off to school. I, think I have a question yeah, uh, for both of you, actually. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, I, because I've heard so much about, you know, the, all the physical changes that happened to you while, while you're pregnant, and you seem to have written, you finished your first novel while you were, while you were pregnant, and you too. I mean, it, it's, it's supposed to affect your brain and all sorts of things, right? Uh, like uh, being and pregnant. I, yeah, yeah, and afterwards, there's like this, the month before I was delivering, there was this horrifying quotes article about how it's been shown that new mothers have lower IQ. I read that piece. I, it was in The Economist. I read that piece. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it's incredible. Like but I'm, I'm just amazed that you could do it. You could like uh, finish your work and sort of like, 
I think it's a completely it different human experience. It's such a, such a phenomenal, unpredictable, inexplicable human experience that I do think I, I had actually fin completely finished the previous book while I was pregnant. Uh -huh. uh, so now it's more motherhood that's affecting my writing, not right. pregnancy. I was doing light edits at that point. Right, right. Uh, but I think it's tuned me into a different part of the world and physicality and existence mm -hmm. uh, that I'm actually really enjoying. I'm finding I'm differently engaged. I'm less solitary in my writing. Wow. That's me. Also, I think uh, Zadie Smith said that motherhood uh, made her like a queen time mm. management skills. It's yeah. like you have no time to waste and whatever time you have, you Monica use it Ali really, really that. well. Yeah. That, that yeah. person in the, you know, you knew they, this is the time there is sleep. And actually, uh, Anita Desai said yes, the same thing. Yes, but there is the pram in the hallway uh, argument. But I think, yes, nowadays, I mean, it's whatever, whatever you can find. And you can get good help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I think we'll open it up to questions shortly. Um, uh, there was uh, one more thing that I wanted to ask about, um, and that was, I've forgotten. Oh yes, the second novel. You know, I was looking up these books, and you have Sylvia Plath, you have Salinger, you have Emily Bronte, you have Boris Pasternak. They wrote their one great novel, and that's it. <laughs> they never wrote another novel either because they, they died of tuberculosis or they got hit by a car or, or various other things. But um, it, is a, uh, it is a terrifying uh, prospect. Uh, Diksha, you, you're covered on your base, but um, uh, Sandeep, Lucy, Prayag, uh, a second novel? What stage are we? Well, I've, I'm writing short stories at the moment. And I've always written very long books to the despair of my publishers. And I go, oh, couldn't you keep it shorter? Uh, but actually, I'm finding this, now, now I'm writing short. And that's very enjoyable. But, and maybe I'll never write a second novel. I mean, again, this feeling that because you're a writer, you've just got to keep on and on doing it. Uh, I spent this part of this week um, reading, because I was writing a review, of an anthology of short pieces by Thackeray. Now, if Thackeray had only written Vanity Fair, his reputation would be about the same as it is, because none of his other novels were anything like as good. So, you know, you, you don't have to keep on doing it. You don't have to write dozens of novels. I, I think that's, uh, that's a great advantage of uh, fiction, is that, you know, you're associated, with, a lot of writers are associated with one or two really important works. Uh, but of course, you know, the challenge is to, to sort of write again. I mean, you want to write again. You're desperate to, to be able to, like, you know, it's, it's a kind of alchemy, I think. You know, there comes this, all these various things you're trying to do, and then it comes together suddenly, and you're not sure exactly how it came together, you know, in the first, in the first instance. So, I, I mean, I'm very early in this. Uh, you know, I'm just reading for the second novel right now. But, uh, uh, you know, it's something that you're desperate to be able to do again, but you're not sure how you did it the first time. So, uh, so you just, you know, you sort of like go with it and you, you sort of try again. That's all you can do. You can just... So every book is the debut novel, in fact. It, it really feels like it. <laughs> yeah, it is. And as you said right in the beginning, um, you know, that first book is a blessing in the sense you never expected it to be out there. It happened, you know, we were talking about rejection. I sent like a first sort of draft of some of the short stories to agents in the US and I got very sweet notes back, but sweet notes of rejection, you know, as opposed to cutting notes of rejection. Mm -hmm. So I had to take those very cold cr crumbs of comfort. And, uh, then the, and I had set it all aside and then the book sort of just sort of happened without an agent in the picture because uh, my, my then editor at Bloomsbury, uh, Dia Korhazra, read another story I'd written in that had appeared in another anthology, asked me, do you have other stuff? And I said, well, you know, there's some stuff I've been fiddling with. And I dragged it out, showed it to her. She was, and so it just sort of fortuitously happened. And so it was an enormous blessing and was a ride. And, and then comes the terror as to, you know, people instantly ask you, OK, so what's your next novel? And uh, in my case, I actually did sign a two book deal. So there has to be mm -hmm. a second book. And I don't know, it might not even be a novel. It might, um, I mean, I, I'm sure, uh, I do want to write again, but you're right. In the, in the, you, you can't just write for the sake of writing, you know, because, oh, it's due. 
it's been two years, so it's due. You have to feel like something to say. And I think sometimes the pressure of these literature festivals mm -hmm. accelerate the process again, because you come to it two years later, and people say, so you have a new book out. And then you want to crawl under the chair <laughs> and say, no, yeah, I'm still plugging the old one. <laughs> Great. Well, we have 10 minutes for questions, so if you could direct them to a particular person on the panel and keep them very short so that we can take as many of them as possible. Uh, there's a lady up front here. Hello? I don't think it's working. Hello? Uh, does someone else have a mic that works? Uh, hello? Yeah. No. Um, we can hear you, but I don't think that. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my question to you is, whoever would like to answer it, if you were to divide the pie of a novel into five slices, story world, people, plot, theme, and style, which would you pick as most important and why? The pie. So, so story pie world, people, plot, theme, and style. Five, story, pa uh, five story, slices, plot, what, what's most important? Character, style, theme. Thank you so much. Can I? Go for it. Um, I think, you know, if you, especially if you're trying to write a novel, it's, you know, don't think so schematically about it. You know, like, uh, try and think of it in a more, uh, all those things are very important. I think you've identified very, you know, very key elements in writing a novel. Style is important, and the people, the characters are very important. But, you know, if you try and, it's not a hierarchy. It's not like something that you need to say, okay, the style is more important than, uh, than the characters. All of these things sort of go together into creating a rich work, into, into creating something that matters to people. And so, uh, you know, don't, uh, again, it's, it's, not, it's not like building a wall. It's not as, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not a very, uh, it's not something that's so regimented. Try and think of it in a more, um, you know, try and think of it as something that all these things have to be, you have to achieve all these things. You know, you have to, you have, to have a good style and you have to have good characters, otherwise your novel is weak, so. Is there a, there's a woman right there? Yeah. Uh, hello. So my question is specifically to uh, Mrs. Diksha. Yeah. Uh, so you said you uh, did a creative writing course. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how does that add an advantage to writing or do you think, does that help in any way? I don't think or it helps everyone. It helped me tremendously. I loved it. It made me a really uh, big reader. I, hadn't, I actually wasn't sufficiently well read coming into it. It made me a disciplined writer because it forced me to have deadlines. Again, that doesn't work for everyone. It does work for me. Um, it forced me to think about why I was responding to certain pieces positively when I was or negatively when I was and how that responded to my work. It made me a better editor. For me, in every way, really, I benefited from the program. But I don't think it's for everyone at all. There's a gentleman here. Hi. Uh, my name is Sagar. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one's for the entire panel. Uh, which are your favorite first books, favorite debuts in literary history? Favorite debuts. Favorite debuts in literary history. <laughs> to Kill like a Mockingbird was pretty good. <laughs> English August by Upamanyu Chatterjee. I thought that was yeah. a fantastic novel. English August. Uh, well, I, uh, literary history is just too far for me to think back to, but I will give you one from the last year, if we can count that. Rachel Kong wrote a book called Goodbye Vitamin, which I thought was just an extraordinary book this year. Well, I, I think, well, God of Small Things, when it appeared, was, I was like, oh, this is a debut. I mean, at that time, we didn't even talk about it in these terms. There were no lit press, no panels like this, but. Sorry, my hand got blank. Yeah. <laughs> okay, skip. Uh, there's a woman back there. Hi, two questions. Uh, I'm a journalist. I have been for about 11 years. So a question for Priyak and, and Sandeepa. As a journalist, you have a very structured way of thinking, which doesn't work when you're writing. There's, there's so much more of flow involved there. So how, how did you segregate that? Because you know, you know, when you get structured, there is a format, there is a body, there's a way you follow uh, your writing skills. So how, how did you manage to you know, break apart from that, create that space in your mind where you can allow yourself to flow? So that's for the two of you. I have a question for Lucy as well. Um, you talked about, uh, uh, you were talking about rejection. Uh, you spoke about uh, uh, taking in criticism. You spoke about taking in 
the criticism from your editors. Uh, how do you know what you incorporate and what you uh, sort of let go of and ignore? So are there specific suggestions that you need to kind of incorporate? How do you know which are accurate? And I also sort of wanted to understand, Diksha shared a little bit of her experience, but if uh, everyone could just kind of in two concise lines. We'll, we'll just keep it to we'll these do. two. That's okay, okay sure. to give other people sure. a chance. Okay. Yeah, uh, Lucy, do you want to go and tell us what in terms of uh, how does one filter through the criticism? What do you take? What do you discard? Well, at an early stage in the book, when there's still time to make revisions, it's, of course, it's very helpful to know what works for readers and what doesn't. Um, and sometimes you can make quite a, a major change in the emphasis of a piece of writing with very small adjustments, just, you know, put deleting or adding a very few words. And so I've, I, I listen to what people said. And also I find that very often the best readers, the best editors, are people who spot the weak links. And I know that in almost everything I've written, in, a, in not, not I hope the final version, but in early versions, there will be a passage or two in which I've thought, mm, this doesn't quite work, but I think I'll get away with it. And if a reader spots that weak link, then I know that I can trust that reader and I pay a lot of attention to them. Um, in terms of, yeah, well, if you think about, you know, as a journalist, you worry you're too structured and try being a software engineer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like the queen of all structure. But I do think that it did force me in a way, uh, it is very hard for me to write anything if I don't have a first sentence in mind and a last sentence in mind and then the rest of it is sort of going from that to the other in a way that makes sense. And that was true of the short stories that then made up my novel as well. And in the end, that last sentence can move somewhere else. But to start, I have to have it. It's almost visually. And it's not necessarily been a bad thing because it allows me, you know, like writing is like jumping into this pool when you don't really know how to swim. And that first sentence, having it in your mind, is like a straw that you're clutching and hopefully it'll lead you somewhere. So I don't necessarily worry that much yet about, you know, when I'm writing fiction or not. I mean, I, I haven't written that much fiction. So, you know, time will only tell as to, you know, how much the journalism training of writing that way is clobbering my fictional style. I was actually surprised by how similar fiction and uh, you know journalism are in some respects because uh, uh, you know the f uh, it took me a long time to write this uh, the novel and when I first started out you know when you, you you read a lot of fiction and you 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 tend to think of it in a very different way from journalism you know from like reporting uh, and you know because the best writers have such an easy style and such a you know there's a kind of grace to their writing and you don't think of it as like really like you know like deeply you know like it's if you read someone like Ishiguro for example you know you never think of it as like really dense writing it's so because it's so easy to, and it's so accessible but when I but what I what you come to realize is when you're writing fiction is that you have to each sentence has to be very careful you know it's actually very meticulously placed everything every writer has a very uh, you know, vivid sense of structure and uh, material. There's a lot of material underneath the surface in fiction. And what I came to realize was that, uh, you know, you have to be as sort of as quick with, uh, with the speed with which you transmit your ideas in fiction also. In my first writing, I was, you know, trying to be like very loose. I had a tendency to go very loose, but uh, when I was working on the second draft, I realized I had to make it as tight as possible. We have time for one last question. We'll take it all the way at the back. There's a gentleman in the back, and we'll take that. Please make it a short question, because uh, this will be the last one. I just wanted to ask, uh, like you said, uh, like you said, Kida, fiction is also a higher form of truth. Or many of you have stories which are real, real life based. So when you reach a, do you have reached a point where you don't know what next, what the character would do that would seem authentic? What, matlab, is it, it's kind of a block where you don't know what next, how to make it authentic? The question so, is, sir, how uh, to make an authentic? Yeah, like fiction also has to have some authenticity inside it, some truth inside it. What if you don't know what next in the story? Have you ever reached a block like that? 
Oh, block. What, what and if, if you don't so, know how what did you deal next? with it? I think that you don't know your character well enough yet. You need to go back and figure them out because you should be able to drop your character into this audience and know what question they would ask. So in that case, rewind and figure out your character. What if you want the story to move is a certain way, but you don't know how the character would be there? I, I think that happens often where you have certain plans for your characters, but in the course of writing, the characters develop minds of their own, and in a certain sense, you have to trust where they will go. In the end, in, you know, a lot of it is about dead ends. You, you write, and you write yourself into a dead end, and then, but the great thing is, since you're doing it at home, in private, you can sort of reverse your way out of there without too much public embarrassment. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. I think we've run out of time. Uh, the authors will be signing books. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you, Thank you. novelists. Thank you.